I'm Adam Todd, and welcome to Classroom Dynamics, a teacher podcast. I believe that the best way to engage students in a 21st century classroom is to immerse them with the transformative tools that will empower each and every one of them to excel in the future world that awaits. My focus is to ignite the spark that propels you and your students into an advanced tomorrow. And your journey into that future starts right now. Classroom Dynamics is supported by Logitech. As education continues to evolve, so does Logitech Education, your partner in content creation for the classroom. With Logitech's cutting-edge technology, students not only learn but also become content creators. Whether it's in-person or online, Logitech's tools are designed to inspire educators and learners alike. Capture every educational moment in stunning detail and edit, produce, and share your creative journey with ease. Logitech Education, inspiring the next generation of creators. For more, visit Logitech.com slash education. Transforming classrooms, one innovation at a time. Introducing the Logitech Zone Learn headset, a sleek and sophisticated tool crafted to enhance your learning experience. Designed for adaptability, this cutting-edge headset effortlessly transforms any environment into a focused learning zone, be it at home, in a bustling classroom, or on the move. With crystal clear audio and advanced noise canceling technology, the Zone Learn headset tailors a personalized learning space for your undisturbed concentration. Immerse yourself in coursework, language learning, or virtual presentations with confidence. The precision microphone ensures your voice is heard clearly in virtual classes and meetings, adding impact to your presentations and discussions. Logitech Zone Learn, where sleek design meets advanced technology, revolutionizing the way you learn. Elevate your study sessions, enhance virtual experiences, and embrace the future of education with Logitech. Always connected, always focused, always learning. The Zone Learn headset, your key to success. Welcome to Classroom Dynamics, the podcast where we get into the exciting world of technology and education. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Adam Todd, and today we're honored to feature a true luminary in the field of meteorology and astronomy as Joe Rayo, a meteorologist and passionate amateur astronomer with over 45 years of celestial exploration, is here to get into one of the most anticipated events that the heavens has in store for us this year. We're talking all about the total solar eclipse of 2024 which will be visible from Mexico through the northeastern United States and parts of Canada this upcoming April, and of course, how you can prepare and engage your students with this stellar event for the ages. We'll also uncover Joe's journey and commitment to bringing the wonders of the universe to the forefront. Joe Rayo's interest in the night sky began decades ago, sparking a lifelong devotion to unraveling the beauty and mysteries of the cosmos. From co-leading eclipse expeditions to serving as an onboard meteorologist during eclipse cruises, Joe has immersed himself in multiple unique astronomical adventures. In addition, Joe balances his role as a renowned meteorologist and a contributing editor for Sky and Telescope along with writing a syndicated weekly column for the online news service Space.com. He's even provided astronomical data to the Farmer's Almanac. Joe's journey intersects weather and astronomy, bringing a fascinating duality to his expertise. Recognized by the Astronomical League with the Walter Scott Houston Award, Joe has dedicated over four decades to promoting astronomy to the general public and today's episode promises to unveil the passion that's earned him such a prestigious accolade. Join us as we embark on a journey with Joe Rayo into how we can bring the wonders of astronomy into your classroom. This is Classroom Dynamics, a teacher podcast. Stay with us. We'll be right back. For over 20 years, Higher Ground has designed functional technology protection, helping students to work or learn anytime, anywhere. I'm Mark, president of Higher Ground, and I want to share with you how you can get a free sample of any of our rugged shells, sleeves, or clear backpacks. Visit hggear.com forward slash sample and use your school's email and address. One thing, don't tell Alex because he'll be stuck with all the paperwork. Request yours and see for yourself how Higher Ground can help save your students and school downtime and money. Just remember, don't tell Alex. Mark, what are all these sample requests filling my inbox?
Are you a dedicated educator searching for fresh and engaging resources to inspire your students? Look no further than Highly Motivated on Teachers Pay Teachers. Discover a treasure trove of easy to use lesson plans, vibrant visuals, and interactive activities designed to captivate young minds and ignite their love for learning. Unlock the potential within your classroom with Highly Motivated from differentiated lap books to test prep passages on a multitude of topics. Our wide range of materials cater to most elementary and middle school grade levels. Join the community of passionate teachers who have already transformed their classrooms. Visit Highly Motivated on Teachers Pay Teachers and get ready to inspire, motivate, and empower your students like never before. Highly motivated on Teachers Pay Teachers, where knowledge meets inspiration. He's an eight-time Emmy-nominated meteorologist and a Space.com sky-watching columnist, as well as an occasional guest instructor and lecturer at New York's Hayden Planetarium. I'd like to welcome my very special guest, Joe Rayo, to Classroom Dynamics. It's awesome to have you on with us today. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's a great honor to be here, and it's going to be uh, wonderful to be able to spread the word about this amazing event that's coming our way on the second Monday in April of this year. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to start by saying a happy belated Weather Person's Day, and of course, to congratulate you on the birth of, as you announced the other day, uh, a new star in your family, the birth of your first grandson. So congratulations. Well, thank you very much. It was a very exciting time uh, when it uh, happened on Friday, and uh, we're all very happy that it uh, turned out well and that he's healthy and I'm all set to spoil him to death uh, as as uh, my first grandson, my first grandchild uh, in the uh, days, weeks, months and years to come. So how ironic was it that it was on Groundhog's Day? Well, yeah, because, of course, I, uh, my my uh, I for over 40 years, I was a broadcast meteorologist on radio and television on television uh, in uh, the lower Hudson Valley on News 12 Westchester and uh, Hudson Valley. And uh, yeah, weather is kind of my forte, although I've also had a very, very strong interest in astronomy since I was very young. And uh, that's why I'm very excited about what's coming our way uh, in April with an eclipse of the sun, a, a total eclipse of the sun, not for the immediate New York City area, but you don't have to go over to a tremendous distance to get into the zone where the eclipse is going to be total. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into exactly that point in just a moment. But before we even do that, I just want to go back a little bit. You even just mentioned it, your journey into two, even of my personal favorite science topics, with which is weather and astronomy. I think they go hand in hand a lot. Uh, for you began over 45 years ago. What sparked your initial fascination with the night sky and even weather phenomena? And how has that passion evolved over the years for you? Um, it got started when I was... Uh Almost seven years old, there was a partial eclipse of the sun that was going to occur on a Saturday afternoon in July in 1963, and my grandfather was the one who uh, directed my attention to this. Uh, that particular morning, he said, you know, we're going to have an eclipse later today, and I, I was seven years old. I, I didn't know what an eclipse was, and he took the salt and pepper shaker off the shelf in the kitchen, and he said... The salt shaker is going to be the moon, the pepper shaker is going to be the earth, and my fist is going to represent the sun. Of course, I was a wise guy even back then, seven years old. I said, Grandpa, that, that can't be the sun, your fist. And he said, why? I said, because the sun doesn't have any knuckles. But anyway, <laughs> uh, he lined them up in a straight line, put the, uh, the uh, moon in between or the pepper shaker between the salt shaker and his fist and said, later today, the moon is going to come in front of the sun and block out the sun, not completely, mind you, but almost completely, and we're going to have a chance to see a solar eclipse. And we had about 90% coverage in New York that day. And after the eclipse was over, uh, I was so fascinated by it. I was really, I was like, as my grandmother would say, I was a chatterbox at dinner time. And that's when my grandfather said, I made a big mistake. We should have taken you up to Maine where the eclipse was total. And then he told me the story about how when he was 16 years old, there was a total eclipse of the sun over New York City that he observed from the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And he said, oh, it was a grand and glorious event. It was spectacular. And oh, I just, then he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to see a total eclipse. Uh, I don't know when or where, but we're, we're going to go. And sure enough, nine years later in 1972, he piled me, my 
little sister Lisa, my mom, my grandmother, and himself, we all took a leisurely 900-mile drive in his beat-up Plymouth Fury up into the uh, uh, Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, where we observed and saw and I witnessed my very first total eclipse of the sun, and that was it. I was hooked on eclipses, and now, to this day, I have seen more than my fair share. I've I've seen 13, and so the one coming up in April will be my 14th eclipse, and I've traveled all over the world. I mean, I've chased them. I've gone uh, uh, up to the North Pole, the South Pole, Turkey, Montana, uh, South America, you name it, I've been there simply to position myself in the shadow of the moon, basking in the shadow of the moon, basking in the darkness of midday to see a total eclipse of the sun. I love how you just described that, basking in the darkness of midday. That, yes. How, that, is a, that really sums it all up, doesn't it? It sure does. It's nothing like you've ever seen. If you've never seen a total eclipse of the sun, there's no way for me to convey to you what it's like because it's impossible to describe. I, I'm sure we've all seen beautiful sunsets and sunrises. I'm sure we've seen spectacular rainbows. Maybe you've even been fortunate to see the aurora borealis uh, in the nighttime sky. But to try to describe to you exactly what a total eclipse of the sun is like is close to impossible. In one moment, it's daytime, and then within like 30 seconds, it's suddenly uh, deep twilight. You're suddenly under a, under a sky where you can see stars, even though it might be 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You see the beautiful corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun, shining around. It's always there, the corona is, but you can't see it because the sun is so blindingly bl bright. But when you move the moon in front of the sun and block out the sun completely, this spectacular crown, as it's called, suddenly flashes out into view, and around the rim of the darkened sun, around the rim of the moon, you can see prominences, gigantic tongues of hydrogen gas lifting off the surface of the sun. It is just an, an amazing, an amazing sight, and it doesn't last very long. In the longest case, it, it lasts seven and a half minutes, but what we will have a chance to see uh, on April the 8th, Monday, April the 8th, will be a total eclipse, which, depending upon where you are along the eclipse track, could last, that darkness at midday could last as long as four and a half minutes, which is pretty long for a, a total eclipse of the sun. That's amazing. So, as you said, I mean, you're trying to describe it, and I know you can't. It's so hard to put those words into play. This upcoming April does promise, hopefully, weather permitting, to showcase a celestial event for the ages, and, you know, and, and of course, the solar eclipse that's going to take place is going to be an event. And for teachers who are going to want to build a science unit around it or even just do a science lesson for them, um, especially for this once-in-a-lifetime event, they to, to capture that moment and prepare the kids and, and really get them excited, how would you explain to them, besides in just layman's terms, what a solar eclipse is. And I know you kind of said that with, with your the salt and pepper shaker and, and your grandfather's fist example. And what could you do to prepare them uh, for teachers to, to get them excited about that? Well, I think the best way to uh, get people excited about this, and by the way, uh, if you, the, the excitement is already happening. Uh, the American Astronomical Society uh, recently made an announcement on the internet saying that we have 15,000 pairs of special solar eclipse glasses. Very important because you don't want to look directly at the sun for the, uh, for the eclipse, except during the total phase. When it's in totality, yes, you can take your, your glasses off and you can uh, look at the sun directly, but only during total totality. But during the partial phases, as the moon is covering the sun, you need these special glasses to block out the visual part of the sun, the very bright part, and also the infrared and ultraviolet radiation of the sun. So these glasses do that. And so the AAS, the American Astronomical Society, recently said, hey, we've got 15,000 glasses, and we'd love to distribute them to civic groups, to libraries, to schools. Uh, just contact us, and they gave an email address. And within a matter of days, all 15,000 glasses were gone. And uh, they're, they're even getting requests for those glasses, and they don't have any more to give. So you could see that people are already getting really hyped up and excited about this. And it's all really uh, the science of shadows. Right. On that day, two shadows are going to pass over North America, a big, broad shadow called the penumbra 
from the penumbra, you see a part of the sun uh, covered, not all of it, but just a part of it. And then there's the umbra, and that umbra shadow, which is going to be about 125 miles wide, the penumbra is going to be huge. The penumbra is going to be almost 6,000 miles wide. And at one point, all of North America is going to be underneath the penumbra, and all of North America, most of North America, is going to see at least a part of the sun being covered by the moon. But that umbra is only going to be about 125 miles wide, and you have to be in that dark central shadow in order to see the sun completely and totally eclipsed by the passing moon. And because the moon goes around the Earth at such a very rapid speed, the moon goes around the Earth uh, in its orbit around the Earth at a speed of about 2,200 miles an hour. So what, we're, what are we talking about? We're talking about a shadow about 120 miles wide uh, moving at a speed of over 2,000 miles an hour. You can see now why during totality, the total phase can't last very long because that shadow is just whizzing along the surface of the Earth. And so you have uh, three, maybe a little over four minutes to enjoy while the shadow, while you're, as I mentioned earlier, basking in the dark shadow of the moon to see that spectacular uh, instance of a, of a total solar eclipse. So that's really what it is. It's, it's nothing more than the science of shadows. We're going to be experiencing on that day the shadow or shadows of the moon being thrown on the surface or projected onto the surface of the Earth. And nor and that people say it's a rare event, an eclipse. It's not a rare event. Eclipses happen of the sun at least twice a year. Sometimes we have as many as five eclipses of the sun in a single year. The problem is we live on a rather large planet, which is three quarters water, and more often than not, the shadow will fall over wide open, open expanse of the oceans. Or over areas where very few people live, like Siberia or Patagonia or Antarctica. Uh, it is very unusual to get the shadows to move over a densely populated region, and that's exactly what's going to be happening uh, in April. There are 32 million people that happen to live in that narrow zone, which will run from Texas up through the uh, Tennessee uh, Valley, Ohio River Valley, Eastern Great Lakes, upstate New York, northern New England, and on into Atlantic Canada, also in a portion of northern Mexico. 32 million people. And if you don't live in the shadow a path, of course, you'll want to travel. And normally we're used to the fact that uh, we hear every year around Thanksgiving that the most heavily populated time of the year uh, is the days leading up to Thanksgiving. Everybody wants to go to grandma's house for Thanksgiving. No, not this year in 2024. I predict this year in 2024, the most heavily populated time of the year will be the weekend because uh, April 8th is a Monday. So I predict that beginning Friday the 5th, Saturday the 6th, Sunday the 7th, you're going to see millions more people on the roadways, on trains, on buses, in the air, all trying to get into that totality zone to experience a total eclipse of the sun. It's it's uh, really, uh, in the case of uh, most people, it is a once-in-a-lifetime event. So tr uh, once every 18 months, somewhere on the Earth, there's a total eclipse of the sun taking place. But for a specific geographic location, a specific spot like where you might live, for that place to experience a total eclipse of the sun, that's something totally different. If you stay where you are, a total eclipse of the sun will come your way about once every 375 years. So that means if you want to see one, you're normally going to have to travel. And those 32 million people who live in the track of the total eclipse in April, they are exceedingly lucky because they they happen to, uh, well, they're beating the odds, so to speak. They are getting a chance not to have to travel. They live in a zone where the eclipse is going to be take coming coming to them let me ask you this so if you wanted to be in that that perfect zone of totality does it matter where in that 120 miles you are or is the the the, the most perfect center the most perfect center if you if you travel into the zone of totality and you 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 let's say you're traveling in your car and you know where the path of totality is and you get into the boundary zone of the total eclipse, the southern limit, so to speak. If you're right at the limit of the eclipse and you get out and you say, okay, I'm going to see totality, 
totality from that point is only going to last maybe a couple of seconds. Sure. You have to continue traveling until you get to the middle of the path. So I said this is about 120 miles wide. So you have to go 60 miles in, yeah. right smack in the middle of the totality zone. That's where the eclipse will be at its maximum. That's where you'll get three and a half, four, four and a half minutes of total eclipse. And if you were to continue up to the northern edge of the shadow track, uh, right on the northern limit, once again, you'd only see maybe a few seconds of totality. So you want to get into that zone of totality, but you also want to go as far into the totality track as you possibly get to. As, as, as near the middle of the track is the best place to be where the eclipse, the total phase will last the longest. That's I, that's interesting. I, I didn't realize that. I, I mean, you would think it would be the the most perfect center that you could find, but that's really interesting. And I'm and I'm also really glad that you, uh, you know, pointed out the fact that you really shouldn't be looking, especially for the kids, uh, if if classes are going to be going out or if parents are taking their kids out, not to look directly into it. I'm glad you mentioned the, the glasses as well. Well, I hope that uh, I hope that schools all across the country allow children. Uh, to see the eclipse and watch the eclipse or give them specific instructions on how you can safely watch an eclipse. In 1984, I traveled to see an eclipse in Greenville, South Carolina, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, and the the, the track of the eclipse passed right over a middle school. So um, me and a bunch of other people, we, uh, we went to the school, we met with the principal, and the principal said, yes, I will give you permission. You can set up your equipment on this in the schoolyard to watch the eclipse. And I said to the principal, I said, well, that's great. And said, when the kids come out, it was right around noontime or whatever. When the kids come out for their lunch or whatever or their play, uh, we'll be very happy to show them the eclipse. We had telescopes. We had binoculars. We had special filtration and everything else. And the principal said, no, I'm not allowing any of the kids to go outside for the eclipse. In fact, we're even going to lock all the doors up and they'll watch the eclipse on television on CNN. They had TVs in the classroom. And I got kind of upset by that. I said, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. This you're is right the- in the middle of the zone. You're right on the eclipse <laughs> zone and you're not allowing the kids to watch. And yeah. the principal was saying, oh, well, you see, it's a liability issue. and We don't want anybody to look up at the sc- we don't want the kids to blind themselves. And I said, they're not going to blind themselves because we're going to be t- showing them how to, how to well, uh, we're, we're not going to do it. I, I got into a big argument. And finally, the principal said to me, he said, look, he says, I'm allowing you and your group to come and set up on our schoolyard. I could just very easily say to you right now, forget it. Get it don't go on our schoolyard. I won't allow that. He said, you understand? And I said, all right, all right. And so we watched it and it was a beautiful, beautiful mm-hmm. eclipse. And especially so. This was a school that was surrounded by shade trees. And during the maximum phase of the eclipse, well, almost the maximum, when the sun was cut down to a narrow crescent, the light coming through the little gaps between the trees acted as pinhole cameras. And on the ground, you were able to see hundreds of crescents. uh, And and that was not going to uh, harm your eyes at all. And in fact, even more beautiful was the fact that there was a light breeze. And so the crescent seemed to come and they can't go almost, they were twinkling, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I'm standing there looking at this and I was this amazing sight. And I'm saying, meanwhile, the kids are locked up in the school, not allowing to being allowed to see this. And of course, after the eclipse was over and we're breaking down our equipment, what happens? The, it's three o'clock. The kids are now going out of course, they know what, what was happening when they were locked inside. And what do you think almost every kid did when they stepped outside? And, of course, the eclipse is long over by that time. What did every kid do? They looked up directly and straight up at the sun. Right. And I, I, I'm scared. So don't look at the sun. It's the, the, you can't. You, you can blind yourself. And it's true. If you yeah. spend time, if you, if you look, for the, look at the sun or stare at it for like 15, 20 seconds, just that you risk putting a, a, a hole on your retina. And that is, of course, what... The, uh, the the lawyers uh, tell the teachers or whatever, or the, 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 and the American Optometric Association, they say, don't look at the sun, don't look at the eclipse, watch it on television. That's a safe way of doing it. But this is a natural event. Right. And this and is such a, such a teachable moment, too. It is. Right. It is. And, it, you know, even with the, you know, kids can make a, 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 a an eclipse projector by taking a box, a regular corrugated cardboard box, you build a, put a hole in one side of the box. Actually, you cut, let's say, a square out and then put a piece of aluminum foil over the square. Tape that aluminum foil over the square that you just cut out. Take a pin, 
push a pinhole through that aluminum foil, and then just put the box over your head and aim the box in such a way so that the sun is coming through the hole that you just punched through the aluminum foil and have it shine through the hole onto the opposite side of the box. Maybe you put a piece of white paper on the opposite side, and there you have an image of the eclipse on being projected on the other side of the box. And you don't even have to use do that. You have a mirror? Do you, do you have a little hand mirror or whatever? Right. Take a hand mirror and put a piece of construction paper over the mirror and punch a little hole in the in the mirror and project the sun's image from the mirror through the hole and onto a wall, maybe 20 or 30 feet away. Bingo, you've got a projected image of the sun. I call that a pinhole mirror. So there are ways that you can safely look at the sun or look at the eclipse. And again, those, uh, those uh, glasses. Now with the glasses, you may not be able to get any from the American Astronomical Society because they were giving them away for nothing. But if you go online on Google or Amazon, type in eclipse safety glasses or eclipse glasses, Amazon and other places uh, will sell you a, a pair of glasses for a couple of bucks. I'm sure everybody can afford that or, or even a, a four pack for like 10 or $12. Mm -hmm. that, and, and you better do it now because I'm sure that in the week or two before the eclipse, a lot of these places are either going to be sold out or they're going to tell you there's a long waiting list and yours may not be delivered until after the eclipse is over. There's one company, by the way, I'll give them a plug. It's, it's a weird name for a company that sells eclipse glasses, but they've been doing it now for 30 years or more. And they are the place to go for the best type of eclipse glasses. The name of the company is uh, I'm just, uh, just, uh, just, oh, Rainbow Symphony. That's why. It's a strange name. Rainbow Symphony and rainbowsymphony.com. They sell eclipse glasses, and you can get them from Rainbow Symphony and, uh, and, and, and all kinds. You can get them mounted in a piece of, uh, you know, on a cardboard frame, or you can even get for, for a little bit more, maybe for like 10 bucks or whatever, it, they, they sell eclipse glasses that look like, uh, like sunglasses. And uh, these are safe. They, uh, they, are, they, they are certified. Make sure that when you get an, a pair of glasses that you have what's called an ISO number. That is the certification that indicates to you that the glasses are safe enough. Now, this, these glasses, again, are made of a special dark plastic called polymer, which will deflect or reflect both the exceedingly bright light of the sun and also the infrared and ultraviolet radiations. And that's the sad part about it is that people... Oh, I've got a pair of sunglasses. I, they're very dark. I can look at the sun with that. Yeah, you can probably. You could probably look at the sun and it looks rather dim. The problem is, is that while the bright light is being diminished, the ultraviolet rays, the uh, radiation that gives you a sunburn, and the infrared rays are coming right straight through that, those, those pair of sunglasses and burning your eyes without you immediately being aware of it. That's, that's awesome. a bad. You don't want that to happen. Get special glasses that... Take care of both the visible, the ultraviolet, and the infrared rays of the sun, right. and that will be uh, 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 the safest way if you want to look directly uh, at the sun during the uh, partial phases of the uh, of the solar eclipse. Also, I think that there are some companies like the American Astronomical Society. There are some companies that are actually been distributing glasses for free to civic groups and also to libraries. I mean, you might want to check around on the internet and see what you can do. Maybe you can find one of those companies that does that. So this way you don't have to, if you want to give it out to, let's say, 100 people, and you don't have the, the bucks to do that, uh, there are companies that have been distributing for free solar eclipse glasses uh, to the masses for, uh, for, for no charge at all. That's really great information. Uh, let me ask you this. So let's take New York City for an example, because you, you mentioned it before. One of your first ones that you saw was New York City. People who live in New York City don't usually get to see and soak up astronomical events such as, you know, meteor showers and things like that, because it's usually too bright because of city lights. But in this case, it's going to be daytime. Um, so if families wanted to take this opportunity to just jump on this and take advantage of the event, weather permitting. If they wanted to go upstate and take that that drive for the day with their family or the weekend, where in the path of totality would the best, closest city be for them to go? Well, in uh, New York City proper, we're going to get 91% of the sun covered. The peak of the eclipse in New York will be at 325 
p.m. that uh, Monday afternoon, April the 8th. Now, some of you may say, well, why should I even bother traveling? 91%? That's good enough for me. It may be good enough for you, but it's not going to be good enough for the show that awaits you if you went into the zone of totality. With 91%, you'd be very surprised. Even though nine ten more than nine-tenths of the sun is going to be obscured by the moon, the sky will be just a little bit darker. The blue of the sky, if we have a sunny blue sky, uh, the blue will appear richer or darker. Um, and it will feel kind of eerie or look kind of eerie. It, 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 uh, it'll, it'll almost be like a cloudy day, except, again, if the sun is out, it's bright and sunny. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, I can't even describe the oddness. Maybe I can call it kind of a semi-counterfeit twilight. And it will be interesting for a few minutes during the midpoint of the eclipse uh, here in New York. But consider that the fact that uh, astronomers and scientists sometimes travel halfway around the world to get into the zone of totality. And here, you, a New Yorker, have the ability to see that same spectacle, the total solar eclipse. All you have to do is just get in your car and travel a few hours north of New York. Um, it will, you'll have to get on probably the best route would be Interstate 87. Uh, and you go north, past Albany, past uh, Glens Falls, uh, past uh, uh, Lake George. The first town that will be in the zone of totality, and that will be right at the bottom edge or the edge of totality, will be a little town called Shroon Lake. And if you continue traveling north uh, on 87 past Shroon Lake and get all the way up to the city of Plattsburgh, and by now you're, we're talking about almost to the Canadian border, Plattsburgh will be in the totality path near the middle of the path, and they will get about three minutes and 50 seconds of total eclipse. Other cities in New York State that are in the totality zone include Buffalo, which is, again, almost on the middle of the eclipse track, uh, Niagara Falls, um, Syracuse, Watertown, New York. Um, these are places that uh, Rochester, New York, these are all places that are in the to totality zone and will experience the, the incredible sight of a, of a total solar eclipse. And what happens during totality? As I said, Within a matter of 30 seconds to a minute, the sky goes from relatively bright daylight conditions down to the darkness of the sky. And you could see this for yourself. Check this out any morning. Go, go outside, step outside about 40 minutes before sunrise. Or this evening, go outside about 40 minutes after the sun has gone down. It gets about as dark as that. And it all happens within a matter of, let's say, less than a minute. It's almost like somebody's turning a giant dimmer switch or a rheostat in the sky, and the sky gets dark uh, with a frightening rapidity. It, 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 you, and, you, and you say, oh, my God, look what's happening. Look, look at us, what, what's, what's occurring. It, it's getting dark. And then, of course, then the stars pop out. The sun gets totally covered. The corona comes into view. And also, all the way around the horizon, all the way around, you have this weird-looking sunrise or sunset color effect. But they're not sunrise and sunset colors that you're accustomed to seeing. Uh, the colors that you're actually seeing around the horizon are more along the lines of a, a saffron or a yellowish color, or maybe the color of, a, of an iodine or a beer bottle. Uh, it's th those kind of colors mm. that, that will be occurring. And it's changing moment by moment. Remember, this is the shadow of the moon passing over you at 2,000 miles or more an hour. So everything is changing Literally, moment by moment, the colors are changing. The illumination is changing. You're looking up and all around. I tell people, they say, well, how, am I, how can I photograph this? I said, forget about photography. Forget it. If you have to photograph it, set your iPhone or your camera up on a tripod, turn it on, let it go, and you just sit back and you watch and enjoy because it, you just drink it all in. And again, when you are in totality, right. that is the one time and the only time during the eclipse that you can look at the sun either with binoculars or if you have a telescope, even better, take a telescope and look directly at the sun because then during that total phase, you get a chance to see close up the corona, those hydrogen alpha flares uh, called prominences, those red uh, tongues of flame emitting off of the uh, disk of the sun. It is just, a, it just an all-out amazing, incredible event. And I warn you now, you get addicted. Because the first thing that comes out of your mouth after you after totality <laughs> is over, the first thing that you say say is, 
I've got to see another one of these. I've got to see another one. This is this is this is incredible. It's just just absolutely amazing. And uh, you're looking at somebody who said that in 1972 in Canada, and again all of these years later, uh, along with that first one in Canada, I've added now 12 others. And I'm a piker, by the way. I'm nothing. You know, you say so. Wow, Joe, you've seen 13 eclipses. That's nothing. There are people who I know, good friends of mine, scientists and astronomers who have traveled around the world and have seen 20, 25, 30. And in fact, one of my lifelong friends who I grew up with in the Bronx, his name is Glenn Schneider, is now Dr. Glenn Schneider. Uh, Dr. Schneider has traveled to 35 total eclipses. Whenever there was a total eclipse, didn't matter if it was Siberia, didn't matter if it was over uh, the South Pole, North Pole or whatever, and sometimes he would go on planes or on ships uh, anywhere to just see a, a, an eclipse of the su- total eclipse of the sun. So you see, it's it is sounds impressive that I've seen over a dozen of these. Many people have not seen their even their first one yet, but there are those umbrophiles, as we call them, eclipse chasers who have seen many, many, many uh, eclipses. They build their vacations around the next area where the eclipse is going to be occurring uh, where it's going to be in uh, totality. I was going to ask you does does each one stand out on its own or do, or is just is just is it as a, as magical as ever no matter what? Oh, each one as I say after each each eclipse is I it never gets old. And uh after the last eclipse I saw the uh, 2017 eclipse that passed from one coast of the United States to the other. I saw that from an aircraft. I saw that from a plane about a thousand miles off the coast of Oregon. And after it was all over, I, I said to, uh, on one television interview, I said, it's going to take a better part of the week for the adrenaline to drain out of my, my body. I'm still wired after seeing what I've just seen or whatever. Yeah, they all stand out in one way, shape, or form. The, the one that stands out in my memory probably the best is the first. It's like uh, when you get your first kiss. It's always the one that stands out above all the others. But in uh, 1979, I was in Montana and watched as the shadow of the moon came uh, toward us uh, from uh, from the Rocky Mountains, from the Judith Mountains, uh, which was a branch of the Rockies. And it looked like there was a tidal wave of darkness heading in our direction as uh, totality approached. And, you know, that's again, that's a scary thing. You have no control over this. And this wave of darkness just approaches you from, from the West. Um, 1971, I was on board a ship off of um, uh, the big island of Hawaii. That stands out for the eclipse, but also it gave me the opportunity to make friends uh, and become acquainted with uh, a man who certainly is a historic figure, Michael Collins, the man who was in the command module of Apollo 11, the first flight, the first manned flight to the moon. Uh, He sometimes is referred to as the forgotten astronaut because while Neil Armstrong and Ed Aldrin cavorted on the moon, he was stuck in the command module going round and round and round. But still, the fact that he was able to go all the way to the moon and he was on that same cruise that I was, and we got to be good friends uh, during the eclipse. I was so sad when he passed away a couple of years ago at the at the ripe old age of 90. So that's another eclipse that stands out. All of these eclipses stand out. There are things that have happened in every single eclipse that, uh, uh, you know, you, th- you think about it, think back upon them with fondness. And uh, you mentioned before about Weather permitting, weather permitting. So far, the weather, ha- I've, out of the 13 that I've seen, the weather has permitted in 11 out of the 13 that I've seen. I have been clouded out twice. Once in Colombia, South America. That eclipse lasted only 38 seconds, but it was, uh, and it, it, was, it was a bitter uh, defeat for, for me because uh, 85 or 90% of the sky was blue and beautiful and clear, but there was one cloud that like a blimp just happened to pass in front of the sun during that short period of totality. And so I missed totality then. And um, my wife and I were on a cruise to Antarctica in uh, December of 2021. We were invited on board. I was invited to give lectures uh, for the eclipse. I, I initially, I passed, I passed up the offer. I said, you're crazy. It's going to be cloudy. Everybody knows that the weather is bad at that time of the year in Antarctica. And the, uh, the cruise line came back and said, well, the eclipse would be the icing on the cake. The cake is the trip to Antarctica. How many times, Mr. Rayo, is anybody going to offer you a trip to Antarctica, <laughs> a chance to see the Antarctica? And I said, you know, right. you're right. 
You're right. So I, my wife and I spent two weeks in Antarctica. We cavorted around with the penguins, which, by the way, we were told by the cruise line, don't go up to the penguins, especially so because some penguins are sitting on their nests. And uh, so stay away. Stay at least 15 feet away from the penguins. Somebody forgot to tell the penguins that because the penguins, I said later on, it was oh. kind of like it was kind of like uh, when you go to Central Park with the pigeons and they waddle up to you for uh, for for breadcrumbs or whatever. The, pit, the the penguins were waddling up to us. You know, you couldn't help but, you know, oh, like, boy. oh hi. You know, like, <laughs> I was thinking about that Bugs Bunny cartoon when he was trying to bring a penguin back to the South Pole. You know, yeah, let's see what kind of a boy right. you are. Oh, you're a penguin. And penguins <laughs> live in the South Pole. South Pole! Oh, I'm dying. And I, I thought about that cartoon many times when I was in Antarctica for the eclipse. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, who would have thought? You lived it. Like, you you lived the cartoon. <laughs> when I'm 10 years old, I'm, I'm watching this cartoon. And here I am now all these years later at the South Pole in Antarctica, cavorting with the penguins, waiting for a total eclipse of the sun, <laughs> which was also clouded out. But so still, it was an interesting a, adventure. Uh, I, you know, that's such a great segue to my last question here, because educators you know, like myself and, and yourself do play a pivotal role in shaping young minds. How do you envision the impact of exposing students to a solar eclipse like the one we're about to have? Um, and what advice do you have for, for teachers who are aiming to ignite that sense of wonder and enthusiasm that, that you share um, with their classes? Because for me personally, when I was growing up, it was the shuttle program that got me hooked on space. That's that's what got me hooked on it. I was I was born 19 1974 in the late 70s and early 80s it was the it was the the space shuttle program and then in uh 1985 when hurricane gloria came over new york with the eye passing over i believe it was the bronx and queens that day that got me hooked on weather and so here i am probably in that you know 10 11 years of age range similar to you when you were younger with your grandfather um those kind of things definitely spark interest in kids. How do you how do you view that those, those kind of events? Well, I'm hoping that the eclipse, this upcoming eclipse, is going to spawn a tremendous interest in science and space and astronomy. Well, this was such an inspirational and fun conversation to have today. I'm really glad that we had the chance to learn more about the upcoming total solar eclipse from Joe Rayo and all of the fascinating information about this once-in-a-lifetime bucket list event for so many people to potentially enjoy. Before we go, I want to thank Joe Rayo once again for joining us and taking the time to just be so enthusiastic about this amazing event that we could all enjoy coming up this spring. And for those of you who have been listening today, thank you for tuning in. Make sure that that you've shared what you've learned or any takeaways or reflections that you've had and tag us on Twitter at Class Dynamics or Instagram at Classroom Dynamics Podcast. We always look forward to hearing your thoughts on the episodes and sharing the different ways in which you're using what you've learned. You can also help support Classroom Dynamics with as little as $3 a month at classroomdynamicspodcast.buzzsprout.com. Once again, I'd like to thank the very enthusiastic Joe Rio for joining us today on Classroom Dynamics. It was a pleasure having him and I hope he'll be able to to join us again in the future. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Classroom Dynamics, where knowledge and inspiration meets innovation. I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion and found it both insightful and uplifting. As always, my goal is to provide you with practical strategies, engaging stories, and powerful insights that can fuel your motivation as an educator. I believe that when knowledge and inspiration do come together, incredible things can happen in your classroom. And for all of you who may feel that it's too late to strengthen your craft, I challenge you to make it your mission to do so. You've worked hard to get to where you are today, and it's never too late to infuse new life into your work. So why not make today that day to do so? I'm Adam Todd, and you've been listening to Classroom Dynamics, a teacher podcast. You can follow Classroom Dynamics on X at Class Dynamics or on Instagram at Classroom Dynamics Podcast. If you haven't already, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And if you know a teacher who may benefit from today's show, please share it with them. We'll be back soon with more captivating conversations, inspiring stories, and strategies that you can implement into your everyday routines. Until then, keep igniting that spark in your classroom and never stop believing in the incredible impact you have as an educator. You're more powerful and inspirational than you think. 
If you enjoyed this episode, you'll enjoy Moby Diversity and Professional Growth, Navigating Brain Pop with Dr. Barbara Hubert. In this enlightening episode of Classroom Dynamics, join us as we dive into the dynamic world of educational technology with the renowned Dr. Barbara Hubert, the Senior Director of Learning Design at Brain Pop. Dr. Hubert shares her expertise on the innovative features that make Brain Pop a transformative learning tool for students and educators alike. But there's also a real intentionality behind the learning design of um, not just the movies, but all of the learning activities that are connected to the movies in that topic. And so um, we know that, again, I'm a, I'm a background knowledge is super important for how you're going to engage in text in the world. And I mean, at, within a school context and outside of a school context. <laughs>